You are listening to Keith Price's Curtain Call. This is Keith Price, and welcome back to another episode of Keith Price's Curtain Call. And I am sitting here now in a rehearsal studio in an undisclosed place in Manhattan, because you know I like to be very how do I say, clandestine about all of my places that I go. And it's really great because, again, you know, many of the things that I get to do as far as this podcast is concerned is to talk to people that are doing all kinds of things with theater, musical theater, regular play theater. And it's really great because sometimes you find little gems where, you know, I think it's more very important that people understand that we all have different experiences and it's really wonderful to see that theater, at least especially in these last few years here, on, at least on the big broad way, has shown that diversity really is not only something that people want to see, but people are spending money to see. And that has, I think, ultimately in the end is what makes diversity like the new thing, the new buzzword. But there are lots of places that have been dealing with diverse subjects and diverse subject matters for quite a minute. I think, in the big city and around the area. And the Bingham Camp Retreat is this wonderful space out of Connecticut that has, for the last few years, have basically been, I think their their main goal has always been to deal with bringing diverse people and diverse subject matters to the stage, both musically and dramatically. And right now, I am sitting in this rehearsal hall with someone who has, this year's year, the, the first show that's coming out, am I right? The first show coming out of this new season of the Bingham Camp Retreat. And um, it's a piece called Family Resemblance. And it is written by book, music, and lyrics by a wonderful, wonderful new woman that I've just met, Mase Asare. I got it right. You know, I got to practice my stuff. (laughs) And she is here with me. She is, you know, the reputation is fabulous. The education, she's working on her PhD now, from what I understand, from the Tisch School. Um, she is here today with me, and we're talking about this new piece of family resemblance that just began their first workshop as of today when we're recording this interview. And it's, it's very exciting to see, you know, again, we're talking about diversity. You know, we've just come out of this whole period where diversity has, like I said before, been the buzzword, but it's really nice to be seeing people who are actually in it to do it because they're just telling their story. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so honored that, that we get to do this and tell you a little bit about the show and Bingham Camp. I love it. So for you, this piece, Family Resemblance, it's an autobiographical piece. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, you were bringing music, you were bringing lyrics, and you were bringing the story. How scary is it to put all of those elements together to tell your story? Yeah, it's definitely challenging. I've done a lot of writing music and lyrics. This is my um, first real go around writing the book, also, and it's there are a lot of balls in the air. So I'm I'm happy to have a lot of collaborators to bounce ideas off of and test the waters and make sure things hold together. But it's exciting yeah. at the same time. You know, it's funny because you were, um, when I came into the studio, you were kind of finishing up something. And of course, you know, nosy me looking over going, I wonder what she's doing over there. And I find that it is, it is a challenge to tell your story. We were kind of joking about it a little bit before we turned on the mics about how the fear of trying to not gloss over the tough stuff. What tough stuff are you trying not to gloss over? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's a great question. So I wanted to write a piece, um, you know, I think I resisted this for a long time, but the piece I'm writing now is about um, being a mixed-race person. And I sort of felt like, no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear about, oh, I'm so confused. I'm a mixed person. Like, it just seemed like not interesting. And I, I resisted delving into it. But I think what the piece is trying to do when we were talking about this today is um, talk about kind of the messiness of diversity and that it's not just like, oh, there's a pretty rainbow. You know, the black people got together with the white people and there was a happy ending. What happens after the wedding? What happens to the kid that is born into that marriage and grows up and has to keep working out her identity day after day, year after year? And so that's the heart of it. So there's a lot of stuff you're going to be glossing over then or trying not to gloss over to make happen. Um, 
I, I find it really great though to hear you talk about this because um, for me personally, I have a nephew who is biracial, and I think that part of his upbringing because he's just turned thirty and he's going to have a kid. <laughs> So I, he called me the great uncle. I was like, no, I'm the fabulous uncle. Never forget that. Um, but one of the things that I used to worry about for him was that it was a little bit of a harder time, you know, a few years ago for him because he was living in the South. And there's a lot of stigma that's attached to so many different things when you're from the South. Um, for you, where did you grow up? I grew up in central Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and my dad is from West Africa, and so from a really young age, um, I learned that in the U.S., clearly I'm black, like there's no two ways about it, but, you know, when I was little, we were able to take a trip over there to Ghana, and over there, everyone was calling me white person, so it just became clear to me that I was the same person, no matter where I was, I hadn't changed, but that depending on the context, people would decide what you were, and so to have to make sense of that from a young age, it's... it's so there's some cross-cultural stuff in the story as well as um, the U.S. situation. I love it. So for you, this is, um, you're telling your story and you're, you're going through the process of, are you reliving a lot of those moments now and finding, you know how in the musical scenario you always try to find that hook to put the, the song to the space and the story. Are you looking at your life that way to find those places to hook a song? You know, I had to do some fictionalizing. Let's be honest. I think when you write about your parents, sometimes it's useful to fictionalize a little bit, especially if they're going to come see it. So um, there, I definitely made some, made some things up. This, this story has uh, a black father, a white mother, and two mixed-race daughters. And then there's the spirit of an African grandmother who comes back from the dead one Christmas and kind of does a visitation and shakes things up. So there's some, some elements of the story that I can't say I have necessarily lived. Um, I also, like my brother was like, why did you cut me out of the show? You know, so I changed some things up so that, so that there could be some, some dramatic shape to it. So there's a, a woman coming home for Christmas. Her, uh, she and her sister are coming home uh, to meet their parents and one is bringing her white boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And so there, and then there's kind of this uh, political crisis that they're dealing with as well, um, sort of a national uh, uh, sort of uh, lab labor crisis and, and that implicates one of the girls works at her job and her and her job has sort of done this terrible um, human rights thing and she's being held accountable. And I think with, with mixed race families, there's a sense that we're all idealists. You know, we believe in a better world. Our parents wanted a better world, and that's why they got together. And this main character, um, it's kind of an ensemble show, but this character who kind of drives this story, um, she's very practical, and she's not an idealist in the same way. And um, there's some tension with her family around the world events as well. Wow. So again, Mrs. Sari is giving you... Um what I'm, I'm trying to, to picture in my mind what the event is, and of course you can't tell me because then that would ruin the entire essence of this piece because that sounds like it's a very core element that changes everyone else's character development. So when you were writing about your, <laughs> since you cut your brother out of the piece, <laughs> um, when you were writing about your parents and you were changing story, story energy, what's different about the parents that you've written about versus your own parents? Um, that's, that's a good question. What if my parents listen to this? Um, well, then this will give them some assurance that you're not like, you know, putting all their business out there. Yeah, well, some of the business is out there, which they know. But I think um, I changed some occupations. Um, but there, there's a lot that is what I've lived and what I've seen. So, um, so we'll have to see. I don't want to give it all away. Mm, this is Sari here with me <laughs> on Keith Bryce's Curtain Call, and we're talking about her piece, The Family Resemblance. And um, it's going to be at Bingham Camp, the Bingham Camp Retreat's first, new, mu first musical of this new season, correct? I have to get it right because everybody's looking at me now. I don't want to be looking crazy. But for you, it's telling your story, putting your story out there. It's like, I, I wonder, though, the process for you as someone who's... Because usually if you're writing the book, it gives you a sense of a distance from the music. And then when you're writing the music, it gives you a sense of distance from the book. But you are all in it. It's like, how hard is it for you to separate enough to make sure that... Because with the lyrics, you're going to be moving the story, story forward, hopefully through the songs. But at the same time, you have to have the story really moving in its own. How hard is that for you to do creatively? 
Yeah, I think I'm learning how to do it better, hopefully. But I think these things also go in cycles. This piece really started for me with the music, um, and that's unusual for me. It's sometimes I'm a words person first, um, although I've, I've gotten a lot of support from my composing, so that's kind of where I've worked most. But um, this piece came to me as a musical idea. I found a musical riff that found its way into the, into the show in the second act. It's sort of the central number um, of, of self-discovery, and that particular, the riff behind that song came to me um, I'd say probably about seven years ago now, and um, it, I, sort of, I sort of felt that I wanted to do something personal, and this, there was an impulse with this, this uh, harmonic and musical figure, and so that drove me to figure out what I wanted to say. I think um, I wanted also to use a lot of different musical styles that are from my own background, so there's some African music styles, um, there's some sort of Americana, kind of folk. Um, you know, I grew up, my dad would listen to high life music and my mom would listen to Joan Baez and, and I listened to show tunes. And so I wanted to find a way to bring all the sounds together. So I think musically, I began musically. And then, um, you know, lyrics, lyrics generally come pretty easily for me. Um, I had to work very hard on the story and then go back and kind of rework some lyrics to make sure they were as, as sharp as they needed to be. Wow. All right, Mrs. Sar, she's giving it to me with the family resemblance. Um, I, I, I like the idea that, that the music came to you first and you said that that usually isn't the case for you. Um, but it's different. I think maybe because you're writing about yourself more so than just fictional characters, because one of the things that's really great is that you are a recent recipient of the Ziegfeld. I'm trying to do this from my memory because I wanted to be all fresh in the moment, but this, a Ziegfeld, what is it? Give me the name of it again. It's the Billy Burke Ziegfeld Award. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about that is you got to be mentored by Daryl Roth, who's like, you know, producer extraordinaire, fabulosa, as well as the recent you know, Tony Award winning Janine Tesori, who has a wonderful history of being one of those women that has moved very, very deeply and forward in the world of musical theater to create this niche to the point where she won her, finally got her Tony for, I think she should have really gotten it for um, uh, Caroline or Change, but you know, th that's being me. I'm just that person, but for Fun Home, which was also a wonderful piece as well. But for you, working with those those particular role models, I would hope that they probably are role models for you. Um, how did that influence the way that you're working now? That's a great question. Um, they're both tremendously inspiring. Um, and also, like, like Janine is, I feel so honored to, to get to meet with her and show her my work and hear her feedback. She's fiercely honest. And she, I feel like, over the past year of working with these artists. First of all, I, I'm so grateful for the Ziegfeld Award. It was the first time it was ever offered. It's a new award for a woman composer of musical theater. And um, I'm, I'm just honored to, to have gotten it. Um, the Ziegfeld Club is an amazing organization that supports theater women. So um, it's been a, I've met a great community of women that write for the theater through that. Um, and so the mentorship that has come with that, I feel like I've been pushed to become more of an artist. You know, I think I was always the one that could kind of say the, say the right thing. Like, I, I can write you a, a pretty cute little song that everyone will feel comfortable listening to. Like, I can do that. But to really dig a little deeper and say something that I really think needs to be said and might be harder to say, mm -hmm. that is the kind of um, honesty that Janine um, has pushed me to do and given me amazing feedback. Um, Daryl Roth has been very supportive. She, she's helping us to bring some musicians, actually, to work with, um, with the actors and musicians at the camp this summer, um, or I guess this fall. And uh, so they both have been incredibly supportive. That's, that's a fantastic pedigree for the first time out for the award. And there's, one, it's you winning. And then two, it's like, what a pedigree of people to be able to immediately attach yourself to. I mean, congratulations on that. Um, f for you now, though, as you're moving forward with this process, what has become the hardest thing to shake of you in order to dig into this as a book writer or musical writer or lyricist? How, how much of you are you really having to push aside to be able to get into the work the way you need to? I think I've had to, um, that's interesting, I haven't thought about it that way. I've had to let go of 
my own circumstances and put the characters in really specific circumstances so that they may be feeling things like what I'm feeling, but in their own dramatic story that has its own dramatic momentum. The book writing has been a real adventure. I'm, I'm, I've been reading a lot of plays. Janine was like, read a lot of plays. So um, it's, it's not easy. It's a really hard thing to do. And I have so much respect for everyone who does it well. Um, but I, I do feel like, uh, if I keep working at it, it's going to get better. So that's kind of what this retreat is all about. Um, I, I don't feel that I have nailed it, but I've gotten a lot of support. And I should also say, I just don't want to forget, so I'm going to get it in here, um, that there's a theater in London that's been really supportive and, and gave me a seed commission to work on, on this piece, um, the Theater Royal Stratford East. So I'm also really grateful for their support, too. I think she's going to support from across the pond. How are you doing? Ms. Masa Asari, correct? Yeah here with me on Keith Price's Curtain Call, and we're talking about her new piece that she's going to be putting through the Bingham Camp Retreat as part of their new season for this, this fall, and at the same time, pushing and challenging yourself to do a lot. <laughs> it's like, you know, again, this is what I'm talking about when I say that it is always fabulous to meet people who are just not only just doing the work itself, but at the same time representing something greater than yourself. Because really what you're doing for this piece is you're really putting a voice to something that, I mean, voice, music, and a story to something that even though you felt at first when you started that it wasn't something you thought anybody might want to hear or want to see, but you certainly have putting it out there. And believe me, when you put those things out there, there will be someone that will put eyes on to that. And for that, you know, for those people, for me, that I'm probably listening to or listening to us right now talk, this, this is a moment for them to experience something not only new, but hopefully life-changing. So, wow. I, you know, I mean, seriously, you know, Bingham Camp Retreat, you know, one of their, their tenets is about making sure that there is diversity and bringing all of the diversity, not just the black folks, not just, the, you know, the Latinos, everybody is involved in that mix. And so, again, that is an organization that if you're listening to this right now and you were looking to support something that is bringing that kind of, of, of diversity, bringing that kind of, of um, passion to the work, you need to go to them, BinghamCampRetreat.org, and, and throw them a couple of bucks. Shoot, well, you know, five dollars is cute when you ain't got it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Shoot. Anyway, so again, Masa, sorry, thank you so much for taking time chatting with me, and I'm glad that there is something to look forward to. That's the thing that for me, I, I get excited about when I get to interview people like you is that you're creating something new for me to see. Like, I mean. I love Hello Dolly, don't get me wrong, and I love Bette Midler, but do I need to see Hello Dolly again? Well, well maybe with Bette Midler, but do I need to see Hello Dolly again as a, a source of, of entertainment for the season? I could go another season or two without it, but this is gonna be great to see the family resemblance be something that might at some point work its way through the fiber. And honey, she's got Daryl Roth and the West End and Janine Tesori in her corner, so, and Bingham Camp Retreat in her corner, so it can't be all that bad, girl. How are you doing? All right, so when we come back, I have a feeling that there's going to be more that I'm going to be talking to because we're going to be in a nice fat package for the Bingham Camp Retreat. So hang out, and we will be back. 